hello once again. Now I will speak about interesting features of the Baltic Sea that I wish to share with you. In general, I have uh, quite a passion towards uh, the Baltic since I moved here for my university studies in uh, 1989. I used to live very close to another sea that was covered by ice and snow for at least half a year, perhaps more than that. And when I came to visit the Baltic Sea for the first time, I think the most surprising was that uh, the sea is so live all, all around the year, irrespective of whether it can be covered also with ice, but I will come back to that. And uh, the other thing that surprised me a lot is how diverse Baltic Sea environment is. Again, despite of very well-known facts that because of the brackish character of uh, the Baltic Sea, it's a um, natural environment, uh, it's biota, animals and plants that are living in the Baltic Sea are not that diverse, so we cannot compare it to the Red Sea or any coral reef environment. But anyway, uh, I was amazed uh, how beautiful the Baltic can be. Again, despite of the gray waves, not so colorful water perhaps, but uh, anyway, uh, it is a wonderful and magic place to, to visit. So uh, I will continue now and, and I will talk about Mare Nostrum Balticum. Why Mare Nostrum? Well, it is because it is our sea uh, and we share a passion, as I already mentioned to you, uh, for the protection of the Baltic. I really like this slide from NASA. I think it is from April 2004, to be precise. And uh, as to me, it demonstrates a lot of features and a lot of peculiarities of uh, both the Baltic as well as the Baltic Sea catchment in just one slide. For example, you can see quite obviously that parts of the sea are still closed, are still covered by ice uh, in the very north, in the Gulf of Botnia. You can see also that the Gulf of Finland, especially the eastern part of the Gulf of Finland, uh, is also covered by uh, ice, though not as much as in the north. But at the same time, you see that uh, melting has started. And uh, with melting, we've got a lot of uh, extra runoff from the catchment from all the land that uh, surrounds the Baltic Sea. And you see this uh, greenish plums. Uh, well, one may say, of course, the, this is more connected to uh, coastal areas in general. And uh, this could be, well, just uh, shallow waters. But as to me, this is not only about that. This is also about the runoff from the territory when uh, water that is drained from the catchment brings a lot of um, sediments, brings a lot of uh, nutrients and other materials into the sea. Uh, and for those of you who are not aware, uh, the actual drainage area, so the place or the area, the territory from which uh, this water is collected to the Baltic Sea is actually four times bigger than the actual sea surface. You can also see some of the major uh, inputs of pollution. And uh, well, on this particular slide, you can see, for example, uh, the incoming plums of sediments from one of the big rivers in the region, in this case being Daugava or Western Vina, that drains to the Baltic Sea in Gulf of Riga. And it brings a lot of sediments all the way down from uh, actually starting somewhere up in Russia, uh, pretty much close actually to Moscow, then draining through uh, Russian territory and then passing Belarus uh, and being a border river between Belarus and Latvia, then draining all the way down through Latvia, through the cascade of uh, several hydropower plants, both in uh, Belarus and in, in Latvia. This river, as many other as actually seven big rivers uh, in the Baltic catchment. It collects a lot of different uh, materials to, to the Baltic. By that, actually deteriorating in a sense, one can say the environmental situation in the Baltic, but I'll come back to that uh, later on. So just a lovely satellite image uh, and yet another one that gives you also a picture of uh, how populated the area is. We'll come back to that uh, later as well, but uh, here you see a lot of agglomerations with a lot of lights uh, during the nighttime, and some may recognize some of those agglomerations. And for example, this one closer to the bottom of the slide, this is Copenhagen and this is uh, Malmö. Uh, move further and see agglomerations connected to Gothenburg in Sweden, agglomerations connected to Stockholm, agglomerations connected to Tallinn, and so on and so forth. 
So plenty of uh, very nice, interesting areas uh, around this map. And a lot of light and a lot of energy efficiency and a lot of energy consumption, of course. So a lot of other environmental problems associated with high standard of living in this region. Just another satellite snapshot that actually demonstrates, demonstrates mostly the proximity and uh, distances in the region. As you can imagine, this is basically not very big region and not very uh, big sea itself. Imagine that from this tip, from this uh, cape uh, to the other side of, of the Baltic, to the western side of the Baltic, western coast, Sweden is approximately just 300 kilometers. So, it is pretty close area and rather short distances between countries, uh, rather short distances between uh, different nations. This area actually, that's uh, a separate enclave area of Kaliningrad in the Russian Federation that is connected with two sand spits, uh, which are unique by itself, with Poland on the western side and with, uh, or southern side, and with uh, Lithuania on east on north side. And yes, of course, the sea is very diverse in terms of various uh, economic activities and uh, would it be pipelines, shipping, tourism, uh, recreation, of course, uh, offshore wind parks, uh, agriculture on land, uh, aquaculture farm, farms uh, mostly in Finland and Sweden. So what is also very clearly stated on this slide by a nature screaming from the island of Bornholm that we need space too, because uh, there's not that much space left uh, for wild nature to uh, thrive uh, in the region. And that's a problem for why we need to have different organizations working to protect uh, the environment in this region. Few facts about Baltic Sea development. This is just, a, again, a snapshot of the geological perspective, how the Baltic Sea has developed. As you see from top to bottom, Pisk has been a lot driven by the glacier that was moving from Scandinavia, leaving out big areas, either flooded with a lot of rocks on the bottom, as well as on the land surface right now, you can find a lot of uh, glacier uh, rocks all across Scandinavia, for example. This is just in a time perspective. It is actually, I think, in Danish, perhaps, or Norwegian. Uh, you can see here the times related to each of the pictures, and you see which are the periods of uh, the sea development according to, to those times. This FKR means uh, before Christ. A few more features. Uh, the region, as I said, uh, surrounding the Baltic Sea is also very diverse, and you see very much connected to the geological perspective that I showed you before. You can see a lot of mounting areas, especially on the Scandinavian part, and then you see a lot of plain on the eastern uh, coast. Likewise, for the bathymetry, for the deep bottoms, uh, you can see how the Baltic is full of either deep parts, there are a few of them uh, across the Baltic, which are Scotland Deep or Bornholm Deep uh, or Stockholm Deep. But those are not as deep, actually, as the World Ocean. So you cannot even compare uh, them to the neighboring North Sea. Because of the Baltic's origin, it, it appeared like a lake uh, through the geological uh, development, and it remained as a lake. As many hydrologists or oceanologists are actually still calling uh, the Baltic a lake. Uh, one of the biggest lakes uh, in the world with brackish water. That's the only difference. It is uh, semi-enclosed. It is connected with the Atlantic Ocean just by few straits between Denmark and Sweden that are called Danish straits. This next slide also demonstrates to you other hydrological or oceanological features that, is, that are important to know. And for example, this is about the ice probabilities, that how often uh, different parts of the sea are covered by ice. If the probability is more than 90%, then it means that basically every year these parts of the sea are covered by ice. And this is only applicable to the north of the Baltic as well as very east of the Baltic, so the, the Gulf of Finland. For the rest, it's basically not every year that uh, those areas are, can be covered by ice. I think the most severe winter when uh, almost the whole Baltic was covered by ice in the recent history was, I think, 1983, something like that. The other uh, map also shows the surface currents uh, on the Baltic Sea. And what is uh, interesting that uh, this is not so-called 
clockwise, but rather counterclockwise. So water that comes into the Baltic through the deep channels, through uh, these few uh, straits. First of all, it is higher density. Uh, it is more oxygenated. It is more salty, and that is why it's actually uh, high density. It comes across and along the eastern coast of the Baltic and then spreads across the Baltic all the way to the north and then returns back the exit from the Baltic Sea along the western coast. And uh, these currents, of course, they do bring besides high oxygen content, and they lose, of course, this oxygen content along uh, their way. They bring, in some cases, also some new species. They may bring also some contaminants, but on the other hand, what is most important, they bring life because we need more oxygen in the Baltic Sea because it's such a uh, closed water body that actually the water turnover is approximately 26 years. So if anything gets into the Baltic, then it remains here in, in the Baltic for yeah at least two decades. And uh, these uh, hydrological features with the uh, semi-closeness, with a lot of volume of water being discharged and drained into the Baltic with rivers, with uh, quite slow uh, water exchange resulted in the construction of a very unique ecosystem that contains both marine as well as brackish and even freshwater species. The further you go uh, northwards or eastwards, uh, the more you will see freshwater or brackish water uh, fauna in those areas. And for example, if you compare the areas in the very uh, middle of the Baltic with this pie chart, as you see here, it will be prevailed by marine species. For example, up north in the Botnian uh, uh, Bay, you will actually see that it is prevailed. The, the fauna and flora are prevailed by freshwater uh, species mostly and some brackish. Yeah, this is another... Uh, interesting and important picture. It explains how oxygenated and high density water is distributed along the Baltic Sea and why there are some peculiarities that are very important also for the Baltic marine environment because there is a very clear distinction between the bottom waters and the uh, upper surface uh, waters that is called halocline. That is the a layer between deep and high dense saline waters and upper and fresh and brackish waters. And because of this very clear distinction hydrologically, uh, there is not that much chances of a proper mixing in regular conditions between these two layers. Uh, this can happen from time to time, but not always. And that is why the bottom layers of the Baltic are usually quite stagnated. They are affected by that bottom's effect. When those waters are enriched by hydrogen sulfide and they are not rich in oxygen at all, meaning that uh, even in the natural conditions, in the natural ecosystem, even without anthropogenic impacts, these waters are uh, most of the year dead. They do not represent any life except perhaps some uh, anaerobic bacteria. Another interesting feature uh, in the region is land uplift. Basically, Scandinavia is growing while the eastern part of the Baltic is uh, sinking into the sea. And this uh, leads to obvious climate change impacts that are foreseen. And these are two scenarios that are presented on this slide. Conservative with the estimated sea level rise, mostly affecting eastern and southeastern coasts with up to uh, 70 centimeter sea level rise and even radical that may happen as well and uh, already is predicted actually to be more like a conservative scenario with the current CO2 emissions level and that uh, predicts that the sea level till the end of this century will rise till almost 1.10 meter. I already mentioned about high population density in the area and this map is also very uh, illustrative that uh, explains that of course Traditionally and historically, the region has developed along uh, big cities, Hanseatic League, for example, and uh, many of Hanseatic League cities were located in, and still are located in the Baltic Sea region. Trade and merchants and commercial relations between the nations have increased development of these big agglomerations and big cities around which uh, the population has become more dense and developed, so to say. Without any... Uh, other obvious reasons, you see that uh, the upper north parts of the Baltic Sea catchment, and here you can actually see the catchment area. So all those borders are 
representing the catchment area that is, as I said, four times bigger than um, the actual sea surface. The catchment area in the very north is not that much populated, but uh, the more you go further south and say Germany and Poland, the more population uh, per square kilometer you, you will find. And that's quite natural, as I said. Uh, and in the south, this is also connected, of course, with agriculture and agricultural development. But finally, what's under the uh, surface of the Baltic Sea? This is also in very interesting. I'm really uh, happy that I have the possibility of sharing these pictures, because I do believe that they either belong to Oceana, one of our big sister organizations that has had a voyage across the Baltic Sea to picture and illustrate how beautiful the Baltic Sea can be uh, uh, on the bottom. Some of those pictures may also originate from a very prominent underwater photographer, Johan Urmian, and uh, his son uh, from Finland. Uh, and you see that these can be very diverse. This can uh, range from lovely sandy bottoms to seagrass and uh, beautiful green meadows. Well, perhaps with not so many colorful creatures, uh, this jellyfish is probably one of the very few species of jellyfish that we have in the Baltic. And that's an ordinary jellyfish, Aurelia aurita. Probably in the very uh, western parts of the Baltic uh, and connection to the North Sea, there might be some observations of uh, other more marine species of jellyfish, but not in the Baltic proper at least. However, there are some uh, really nice mollusks. Mostly you will find them in uh, more saline areas of, of the Baltic Sea. This fantastic meadows of uh, eelgrass, key species of the proper uh, marine pastures, marine meadows. Uh, however, this one is already demonstrating some effects of eutrophication with filamentous algae uh, growing on top of uh, Zostera. There are, well, one may even say some corals, but uh, they are on the very uh, edge of uh, the Baltic and uh, its connection to the North Sea. There might be some uh, nice crabs as well, uh, both native, but those native are uh, especially located again in the marine regions of the, of the Baltic, closer to, again, the exit to the uh, North Sea. But we also have a number of uh, alien species of crabs actually uh, spreading, unfortunately, across uh, the Baltic very rapidly. And one of them is called uh, Chinese mitten crab that actually spread over the way further to the north and east of the Baltic and even has now been noticed in the rivers. Just a couple of more pictures with Porcellaria, different types of marine algae, both red algae or brown algae that are containing a lot of uh, substances that are very important for agriculture in um, Purposes like, for example, agar agar, as some of you know, can be extracted from Furcillaria and from Fucus as well. And that is used in uh, cosmetics, confectionery, in sweets. We do not have as many uh, macrophytes, the big algae uh, in, in the Baltic Sea, anyway. It's lovely also on the surface, of course, <laughs> but I will um, say a couple of words about the species, uh, key species as well in the Baltic. And yeah, this is a very typical Baltic ecosystem. A nice cartoon uh, by a Finnish artist that actually demonstrated that there could be seal, duck, cod, saberfish, or uh, maybe sargan, for example. Uh, there could be also sprout and uh, uh, flatfish. But on the other hand, there could be as well uh, species like bream all in the same time and all in the same place. So bream that is typical for freshwater ecosystems can be easily found uh, along the coast of the Baltic as well. Uh, this is a little bit more scientific representation of different species of fish uh, in the Baltic Sea. And again, very different from each other, but again, both freshwater like uh, pike or pike perch, verbot, very typical uh, marine or seawater species like cod, herring, flatfish again, Surprisingly enough, <laughs> these species, uh, this is stickleback, they are very abundant and becoming very abundant since many, many years in the Baltic. And they are, in terms of numbers, surely outweigh all other species in the Baltic. They are small, of course. This is not a comparable uh, picture where you can compare the size of one fish with another. When it comes to fish in general, uh, the situation is currently is pretty bad. Uh, this chart and this graph perhaps is also not very representative because since 2011, 
there were already 10 years has passed. And basically what we can say right now that uh, the population and abundance of cod has dropped even further. And by now, uh, any catch of cod in the Baltic Sea is prohibited, at least within European countries. With the level of uh, big predators like cod being on decrease, the planktivorous uh, species like zoo and, uh, and phytoplankton eaters like uh, herring and sprat are blooming, and especially sprat. Uh, it's actually on the rise right now. But what we can also say that, well, there is a shift in the ecosystem that has been caused by the decline of the predator like uh, cod, and that allowed for a rise or a niche or wider space for uh, development and expansion of uh, other species, which is certainly not what we want to see. We want to see the species in balance. Plenty of other nice creatures in the, in the Baltic, and those are uh, yet other type of uh, uh, key species uh, we all perhaps are very happy to see. Uh, and these are different types of seals. Here yeah, you can see them on the holouts. Uh, in many places uh, around the Baltic, uh, would it be on east or west, on south or north? You can probably find quite many of seals nowadays. There are three species of seal uh, in the Baltic Sea, harbor seal, gray seal, and uh, ring seal. The ring seal right now is probably the only of the threatened species, uh, especially in the eastern uh, part of the Baltic, in the Gulf of Finland. And partly the decline is connected uh, to, well, dis disturbance by ship traffic, that's one thing, but uh, the other thing is also decline in ice coverage. The important thing for ring seal is that they are reproducing on ice, and in case there is no ice, there are no seals. So some more nice pictures of uh, seals, and here's probably a seal pup on uh, a coastline on the, on the beach. <laughs> they are becoming more and more frequent visitors. CCB has even started an educational campaign to educate people, local residents, about uh, how to interact with uh, seals in case you see them on the beach, uh, how not to threaten them, scare them, but rather let them uh, be there because uh, in many cases they are just coming there to rest. And especially this is very uh, common right now when uh, there are more seal pups appearing, several organizations within CCB who are dealing with uh, communicating to people the importance of protecting seals. This is again the example of seals haul out during winter time and possibly this could be uh, ring seals uh, while they are preparing for reproduction, but um, I do not know exact and this is a typical seal pup. There are also some environmental problems connected to uh, the increase of uh, seal population. Well, this is a very complicated uh, story, let's put it this way, because uh, this is not just seals being responsible for this, what you see on the screen, maybe a little bit uh, uh, disturbing picture. Uh, that's a salmon being completely eaten by a seal and most probably taken out of a net. So fishermen since many years have started complaining about seals attacking their catches and eating up too much fish out of the fishing nuts. As you can imagine, fishermen are not very happy about that because they are losing their yield, they are losing their catches. But the problem is that uh, seals do not have enough fish to eat in, in, sea, in sea itself. They're coming closer to uh, coasts and there they find nuts with lovely uh, fish in it. And of course, what they do, they eat it. So it's not really a problem of uh, seal population increasing and expanding, but it's rather the problem of, uh, again, the shift in the ecosystem when they don't have enough uh, fish to hunt at sea in the wild. And that unfortunately also results in uh, many seals being by caught by uh, fishing nets. So they just get entangled in uh, fishing nets and they, of course, uh, sink and die. This is a sad picture, of course, but uh, that's the reality that we face. And that's unfortunately not the only problematic thing that uh, we see in case of conflicts between seals and fishermen. The other interesting animal, uh, and that's the only cetacean or the only whale that I have mentioned to you, this is so-called harbor porpoise, uh, a very nice creature, very small animal, a little bit more than a meter long, so the adults are pretty small. You'll see a picture later on, comparable size of the animal. They are very shy. 
you cannot see them quite frequent uh, in the Baltic. Uh, you probably can witness them more and spot them more in the Danish Straits, where their population is uh, much bigger. But in the Baltic Sea, in the main Baltic Sea, we have a small population of just 500 animals, approximately 500 animals. They are belonging to, well, cetaceans family. They are relatives to dolphins, but they are more close in terms of their relationship to a killer whale, basically. And you can see it very typical thing that compares them or what's the difference between uh, the hypopoposis and dolphins is that dolphins usually have a rostrum, ra relatively long nose and jaws, while hypopoposis that you see here, number 12, that's a very small animal with quite small rostrum comparing to dolphins. And this is the example of hypopoposis being released from a net. I think the picture is probably Finland. There was a bycatch of hypopoposis in a fishing net a couple of years ago, and it was released safely. So we were happy first about this news, but also about the news that hypopoposis are still uh, happening and you can observe them even in Finnish waters because uh, most of them are breeding and populating the so-called Baltic proper, uh, the part between the island of Gotland and the island of Monholm in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And this is how you basically can spot them on surface. If you are lucky, <laughs> they are very humble and shy animals. And unfortunately, since many years, their population has declined also because of the hunt. You can see uh, these pictures about that hunt uh, here. And right now, the main problem with them is also bycatch. They get by caught by fishing nets, and uh, this is where CCB is working to protect them and help restore their population. They are unfortunately quite often stranded, and that's again sighting of a stranded uh, hobopopus on the Baltic beaches. That happens everywhere, irrespective of a country. As many say, it can be connected to, for example, underwater noise that happens in the Baltic Sea related to different sources. Would it be shipping? Would it be explosions? Would it be pile driving for construction of various offshore activities? But uh, as harbor purposes as any other cetaceans are very sensitive to underwater noise, they can be disturbed. Their uh, eco-sounding and eco-location uh, abilities can be disturbed and they can lose orientation, or at least it is believed uh, that it can be the connection. And they end up on the seashore in most cases, unfortunately, they are dying. There are a number of uh, awareness raising campaigns to protect holopopis across uh, the Baltic Sea countries. And uh, this is just one example in Germany. We also may have uh, some occurrences of other bigger whales, but these are very random occasions and those could be different types of whales in fact and that's a real picture from the baltic sea uh, but those are generally coming with the salt water inflows uh, from the north sea they are just uh, losing orientation and uh, suddenly end up in a trap called the baltic sea so uh, they stay in the baltic for a couple of days and then they leave I'd say, just say a few words about the main environmental uh, problems right now in the Baltic. You have to be aware that right now the Baltic Sea is quite problematic in terms of threatened species and uh, habitats that are threatened across the Baltic. And these are just a few percentage of species being under threat. And those include, for example, European eel. Those include a lot of waterfall birds. Uh, and those include different uh, types of underwater and surface habitats. And despite the attempts by the Baltic Sea countries to protect various species and habitats by protected areas, uh, we still are lacking the protection regime. And uh, now there is a goal uh, that 30% of the Baltic Sea should be covered by marine protected areas. Right now we have only 12 to 15, perhaps uh, a little bit more maybe. We still have a problem with hazardous substances, and uh, most of the Baltic Sea is quite contaminated with hazardous substances. These are, again, data since quite a while. In fact, I think with the updated information, this is uh, already uh, even further bad, unfortunately. And this is due to new knowledge that became available about emerging substances, for example, residues of pharmaceuticals, various flame retardant substances, and more monitoring data becoming available, and that allows actually to demonstrate and Unfortunately, the state of the Baltic Sea is still pretty bad in terms of pollution by hazardous substances. This is connected to different types of chemicals that we are using in our household, in our daily life from different industries. We should all be aware that this is coming not only from discharges of wastewater, but also from uh, what we use in daily life. And this is important to address in our work.
Baltic Sea has been known for a lot of efforts to ensure safer shipping and more clean shipping. Perhaps this is this slide is not the best in terms of demonstrating how clean can be clean, but believe me, since many years, Baltic countries uh, have introduced quite a lot of restrictions to limit, for example, inputs of nutrient emissions, uh, nitrogen emissions, or sulfur emissions from from ships, as well as to limit uh, oil spills, both intentional as well as uh, unintentional. Uh, this is just a slide that depicts what kind of environmental problems can be associated with shipping. And just for you also to understand, shipping is a very important uh, sector of industry in the region. Uh, shipping can be visualized with the information that each single moment there are more than 2,000 ships in the Baltic Sea, both big and small, both on the frequent routes, uh, carrying whatever kind of uh, goods across the Baltic, but they, of course, all do uh, provide certain environmental impacts and this has to be addressed as well it comes the biggest problem and that's eutrophication and eutrophication can be demonstrated with this nice picture uh, i already showed you one with the uh, eel grass being overgrown with filamentous algae here you see it as well uh, not very nice and transparent waters uh, and not very nice appearance on the bottom of the boat. This can go even further with less transparency and less uh, ability for uh, green plants to absorb uh, uh, solar light and uh, UV radiation because of this coverage by uh, filamentous algae. Again, that uh, introduces more and more problems to the Baltic because uh, the less you have this uh, green coverage on the bottom and in the water column, the less you have generation of oxygen and release of oxygen into the water. The more you have then decomposition that requires a lot of oxygen to be used. And so this picture looks a little bit better, but anyway, uh, you see also this uh, overgrown of uh, filamentous algae over the macrophytes. And that uh, leads to deteriorated conditions on the sea bottom, with sea bottom uh, fauna being gradually wiped out because they are more uh, sensitive to low, condition, uh, low oxygen conditions. And this leads to replacement of the uh, traditional native fauna with uh, less uh, sensitive to oxygen. It may look worse as this. On the sea surface, it actually may look like a, a swamp, uh, believe me or not, but in the middle of the Baltic, you can see this uh, ugly yellowish, brownish, greenish uh, lump of algae, of mostly phytoplankton, uh, blue-green bacteria or blue-green algae that are clustered together and that flows like yeah, a big swamp uh, just in the middle of the sea. And unfortunately, the most recent scientific data shows that none or almost none of the uh, areas in the Baltic Sea can be classified as in good environmental status with regards to nutrient pollution. And the bottoms of the Baltic would look like this because they are lacking oxygen, they are dead. Uh, there is not, no life there. How and why this happens? Well, basically because of inputs of nutrients, both from agriculture uh, and sewage, wastewater treatment facilities, as well as from transport with airborne emissions actually contributing to 25% of nutrients, particularly nitrogen inputs to the Baltic Sea. There are other interesting features you may uh, learn yourself about the Baltic, and this is, for example, about chemical munitions dumped after the World War II in the Baltic Sea. There are several uh, dumping grounds uh, across the Baltic. Two of them are big and located in center of the Baltic, close to Gotland and close to Bornholm. The third one is close, well, it's basically on the border between Baltic and the North Sea. And that's in the most deep place, I think. And uh, well, there are, of course, concerns that there might be a release of toxic agents out of those dump sites. However, the monitoring so far shows that unless you touch the shells or bombs that are dumped, there shouldn't be any problem. So the precaution approach says leave it as it is uh, and have uh, preparedness in place uh, in case you come up to encounter uh, those chemical munitions. And uh, according to the statistics, according to the monitoring, the number of cases has significantly declined when those munitions were caught into the nets by fishermen. And that means that actually regulations that were put in place to limit fishing in the areas that are uh, risky have proven to bring the result. There are some other interesting features. 
uh, I just told you about the biological features and about the uh, history and hydrological features, as well as environmental problems associated in very few words. But there are other features and interesting objects on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. This is just for you as a teaser to uh, explore more. There was a finding of uh, an object that was looking like a UFO several years ago, I think in the Gulf of Botley and not very far from where I am right now. There is a lot of things to explore. So welcome to the journey to the Baltic Sea. Many thanks for your attention.